Good morning, everyone. I'm Ted Henry in San Diego, California, and we increasingly have a very international group here. Welcome to our Ramana Maharshi weekly group satsang. And on the first Sunday of every month, of course, Michael James is here. And I'm speaking directly to those who are watching Michael now on YouTube. Uh, many people from around the world see these videos. They've been increasingly asking me how they can be a, a participant. And I see that a variety of people come in and out every month now. So I invite them in particular to consider joining us. Uh, let me listen here to, to consider joining us on Sundays, the first Sunday of every month. And if you would like to participate on those programs or join us even on any particular Sunday, of the month when we have our morning satsangs, just write me. I'm Ted. You can write me at newsguy55 at aol.com, N-E-W-S-G-U-Y 55 at aol.com. And I'll put all of our notifications on the list for our weekly Zoom meetings. Um, that's everything here. So we'll get started with a question. I usually send out a notice asking for questions, and I got six of them coming in in the last day and a half, two days. And McNair is with us, and he has uh, the first question, which I'm going to read, McNair, because it's a little lengthy, and I want to make sure we get into it. So, McNair, thank you for your questions. There are concerns probably many of us, if not most of us, have had. In one way, you say, I understand the need to become familiar with Ramana Maharshi's teachings, especially as regards self-inquiry, uh, an important point that I've harped on for a long time to get to for understanding. To that end, I've read much about him and the teachings as well as the writings attributed to Ramana Maharshi. But if the one overriding purpose is to lead or to show us the way to engage in self-inquiry, you say, once I grasp the basic process of self-inquiry, is it really useful to continue reading and studying about Ramana Maharshi? After all, isn't it such reading and studying working in the realm of human illusory physical thought, which seems to be what we are supposed to move away from. Excellent question. Mike, over to you. Um, Bhagavan's teachings are extremely simple. So it's relatively easy to get a basic grasp of what his teachings are about. But although they're very simple, they're also very deep and very subtle. So um, though, though that, that is, we can never say we have fully understood, particularly the practice of self-investigation, though it's a very simple practice, it's simply a matter of attending to ourselves. It is a very deep and a very subtle practice. So our understanding, as we go deeper in the practice, our understanding becomes deeper, clearer, and more refined. Um, this deepening of our um, understanding, the, the principal means by which our understanding is deepened is by the practice itself. But that it is also supplemented by um, studying Bhagavan's teachings and thinking about them carefully. So if if we, if when, when I talk about Bhagavan's teachings, I'm not talking about all, there are so many books that have recorded um, uh, conversations with him. These books, though there are useful things here and there in them, they are not truly representative of his teachings for two reasons. Firstly, because the answers Bhagavan gave were appropriate to the questions that were asked and the level from which the questions were asked. So many of the questions were asked by casual visitors or by devotees who didn't have such a deep understanding of his teachings. So he gave teaching, he gave answers that were appropriate to the level of understanding of the uh, people he was talking to. So often the things he would say when, were not truly representative of his core teachings. It was the appropriate thing to say to that person at that time, but that doesn't necessarily mean it, is, it represents his core teachings. Also, 
um, these books that record what he said, they were not very accurately recorded um, for obvious reasons. They weren't re uh, recorded on tape recorders. No one was there taking shorthand or any such thing. They, um, generally what happened, people would hear conversations. They would then afterwards uh, jot down from memory. Uh, in, it's, in some cases, it may be after a few hours or even a few days, or some case it may be relatively soon afterwards, even if it was half an hour afterwards. But if you're listening to a conversation, how much do you actually retain? You don't, you, we don't mem remember every word that is spoken. Firstly, we, what we remember is what we understood of the conversation. So if our understanding is not very, uh, very accurate, very deep, we will we will re we what we will remember is not what was actually said but what we understood of what was said and also memory we, we never remember every word of a conversation we you remember the gist of it so these the recordings are not very accurate so but if we want to get the to the real heart of bhagavan's teachings and really understand the the, the core principles of Bhagavan's teachings, the principal source is his own original writings. Um, there are other good books, like, uh, for example, Guru Vachika Kovai was recorded by Murugana. They, it, he recorded things that Bhagavan said, not in his exact words, because Bhagavan was obviously speaking in prose. Murugana recorded in poetry. But because Murugana had a very deep and subtle understanding from his own experience of following uh, Bhagavan's path and uh, reaching the goal, um, he was able to, um, to encapsulate in those verses the real um, import of what Bhagavan was saying. So Guru Vachaka Kavai is a very good supplementary work, but it's quite a big work. It consists of some 1,250-odd verses, which we're not likely to... Um, so we we will if we read it we'll we'll remember some of the verses not all the verses whereas Bhagavan's original writings are actually relatively few in number. There's um, Nana Who Am I, which consists of just twenty paragraphs. It, uh, Bhagavan wrote it in the form of an essay, though it was originally question and answers. Bhagavan rewrote in the form of an essay, and while doing so, he refined it and he presented it in a very clear way. Um, so that's just 20 short paragraphs. Um, then there are other important works like Uludu Napadu, it's just 40, 40 verses plus two um, benedict benedictory verses. Um, Upadesha Undia is uh, 30 verses. And small works like um, um, Anma Bidde is five verses, um, Ekama Panchakam, five verses. Um, Apala Patu is uh, four verses, um, and um, uh, then there are some other works like Uludu Nabdu Anabandam, the supplement to the 40 verses. That There are some very useful verses there. Some of the verses are original verses by Bhagavan, but it's a mixed bag. There are a lot of verses there, but uh, Bhagavan translated from various sources, so they don't all perfectly represent his teachings. And then there's Arunachal Stuti Panchakam, the five hymns to Arunachala, which also um, which is also very very important. So, in all, there's probably about about two hundred and fifty verses contain all of Bhagavan's teachings, and in those verses, we can get to the very heart of his teachings. So it's not a a lot for us to study, but if we if we spend many years not just studying these works, but also trying our best to put them into practice. As we go deeper in the practice, our understanding gets refined and we begin to see in these works new layers um, of implication. That is, when, when Bhagavan writes verses, they, one thing is it contains a meaning. The meaning is often quite straightforward, but in 
contained within that meaning is a huge amount of implication. That implication comes clear to us to the extent to which we go deep in the practice. So none of us can say that we've, we've read all of Bhagavan's works and understood them perfectly. We may have a good grasp on them, but there's always potential for our understanding to go uh, to deepen and become more refined. And this happens naturally by practice. So if we think that we just have to read his teachings a few times, get, grasp the, set, uh, uh, the principles, and then start putting them into practice, it's like uh, saying we, we want to travel to a new country we've never been to before. We've seen a map of the country. We've studied the map quite carefully. And then we, set on, we leave the map behind and set off on our journey. When we actually come to that country, we can do, there can be so many things we come to we, we come across which we were not able to understand from our study of the map. So we may be confused which way to go. <clears throat> Whereas if we take the map with us, as we travel to that country, as we travel through that country, the map becomes more and more meaningful to us. The map becomes more and more useful because we we recognize that, that is the various symbols on the map, we recognize what they are actually representing, what it actually looks like, how it actually is. So um, to, to, to think that we can, we can travel to a new country just by studying a map and then leaving the map behind and going off on our travels it would be a foolish approach. Obviously, the wise thing to do is to take the map with us. Then as, whenever we we are in doubt about which way to go. We can refer to the map and we will, we will compare the map with what we've actually seen. The map will become more and more meaningful to us and it will provide us the guidance we need. Obviously, um, reading a map and traveling in the country, these are relatively gross things. Whereas Bhagavan, the path Bhagavan has taught us is a very deep and very subtle uh, path. So this analogy has its limitations, of course, but it, if we if we are following his path uh, and at the same uh, and at the same time reading and uh, thinking about his teachings, I mean, if we're doing them side by side, his teachings will become more and more meaningful to us. They will provide provide us with more and more clear guidance for uh, for following this path. Because when we are following this path, we come up against all sorts of difficulties. The difficulties obviously aren't difficulties external to ourselves. The difficulties are our own um, vasanas, our own uh, likes, dislikes, desires, attachments, and um, but we 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 face so many difficulties when it, when it, we're actually putting it into practice. Because though though we 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 think that we 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 want. Um, we want to know ourselves, we want to attain liberation. When it actually comes to practice, we begin to see how strong are our desires to experience things other than ourselves, and how relatively weak is our love to know ourselves. So we, we come across so many practical difficulties. If we are reading and um and uh, and reflecting on Bhagavan's teachings along alongside our practice, they will give us guidance. They will give us encouragement. They will. Um, it, it's hard to say in how many ways we we can be helped by Bhagavan's teachings. So the simple answer to the question is, um, no, it is not sufficient just to think that we can read a few times his teachings and then uh, devote ourselves to the practice. If we, if we keep his teachings as a, as a constant companion to ourselves, we don't always have to be reading them. If we've read enough times, we'll be familiar with them. But if we, even if we're not reading them, we should at least be thinking about them. And from time to time, we may want to ref refresh our memory. What exactly did he say here? So we, we go back and read it. So um, studying and thinking about his teachings. That studying is what is called sravana. Sravana literally means hearing, but it includes uh, it, it, absorbing the teaching, taking the meaning. But uh, a manana means thinking deeply about it, making sense of it. Because when we read Bhagavan's teachings, his teachings are 
extremely deep and radical. They, they are challenging all our beliefs, all our preconceptions. So they, they, they challenge us to change our view of things. So um, we, this is, this is, that is absorbing and really grasping the import of his teachings. It takes time. We don't read, we don't grasp it just by one reading or by thinking about it a little. The more we think about it, the more sense his teachings make to us. And um, the more we will find that they're helping us, encouraging us and guiding us in the practice. Um, so that's the main part of the question answered. But one other thing in the, the final sentence, after all, isn't such reading and studying working in the realm of thought, which seems to be what we are supposed to move away from? Um, yes, of course, this is all in the realm of thought, but all, well, all spiritual practice is in the realm of thought. That is, who is it who is to investigate themselves? It is ego. And according to Bhagavan, ego is itself a thought. It is the first thought, the root of all other thoughts. So we, um, it is a, many people have a misconception, but self-inquiry means um, stopping all thoughts. If you stop all thoughts, that is self-inquiry. That is not the case. Merely stopping thoughts is not the means to know ourselves. Every night when we fall asleep, all thoughts stop. But we are not enlightened when we fall asleep. I mean, we are not enlightened by falling asleep. Enlightenment means the, erad the permanent eradication of thought. But thought will be eradicated permanently only when its root is eradicated. The root of all thought is the first thought, I, namely ego, the false awareness, I am this person. So until, so long as this ego, that which is aware of itself as I am this person, so long as that exists, we are in the realm of thought. So it, um, it, it, uh, all thought will cease as a result of self-investigation, but that is a byproduct. The aim of self-investigation is for us to know ourself and thereby to be what we actually are. Um, when, we, when we know what we actually are and thereby remain as we actually are, all thought will thereby cease. But that is not the, that is not the principal aim. This is very, very important to understand because um, a lot of spiritual practice is aimed at uh, stopping thought. In fact, the whole of yoga the, the, the principal aim of yoga is to stop thought. In the uh, right at the beginning of uh, uh, of uh, the Yoga Sutra, Patanjali says he defines yoga as yoga's chitta vritti nirodaha. That means uh, um, yoga is uh, curbing or stopping the. Chitta vritti. Chitta vritti means the activities of the mind, in other words, thoughts. Bhagavan said that is not is, is not an adequate goal because I mean Bhagavan pointed out the obvious thing that we every day when we fall asleep, all we stop we stop thinking. But that doesn't that is only a state of manolaya, a temporary dissolution of mind. We are aiming for manonasa, which is permanent dissolution of mind, annihilation of mind. And that can be achieved only by an eradicating ego, the root of all thought. So we are in the realm of thought so long as we are doing any spiritual practice. Even self-investigation is still in the realm of thought because that that is in self investigation we are turning our attention away from all other things back towards ourself and thereby we are bringing about the subsidence of all thought but until ego is annihilated completely we are still in the realm of thought so um self investigation brings about a subsidence not only of other thought but of the uh, first thought i but until that first thought is completely eradicated, we have we have not escaped from the realm of thought. So we shouldn't. Thought is thought is a, a means on this path. That is, we should use thought intelligently. 
Thought is, after all, the directing of our attention towards anything is a thought. Instead of directing our attention towards any other thing, our aim in self-investigation is to direct our attention towards ourself. Because attending to anything other than ourself is an activity of the mind. So it, 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 it's an arising of thought. Whereas attending to ourself is a cessation of mind, a subsidence of mind, a cessation of thought. So um, the cessation of thought is brought about by self-investigation. It's not the it's not the principal aim of self-investigation. The principal aim of self-investigation is to know ourselves. So we shouldn't think that we have to be without thought. Generally, when people think that we have to be without thought, what they mean by thought, what they understand by the term thought, is the mental chatter. Some people say, I sat for meditation and for 20 minutes I was without thought. The eye that was sitting, the bod well, the body that was sitting is a thought. The eye that was taking that body to be eye is a thought, that is ego. The 20 minutes are a thought, it's all just thought. So when Bhagavan uses the term thought, of course it includes the mental chatter, but it, by, it's not limited to mental chatter. Anything other than our own being Anything that rises, anything that appears and disappears is a thought. So the first thing to arise and the last thing to subside is this first thought I. So that even this thought I, namely, I mean, even this I, the ego, is itself a thought. So, um, uh, yes, ultimately we're supposed to move away from thought, but in order to move away from thought, we need to use the mind. We need to turn our attention away from other things back towards ourselves. And for that, we need we need understanding. That it is, as I say, this is a very deep and subtle practice. We can practice, that is, the depth of our practice depends upon the depth of our understanding. As we go deeper in the practice, our understanding deepens. As our understanding deepens, we're able to go deeper. So, um, it's not just a matter of um, read a few books, then stop thinking. That is, that is not what the practice is. The practice is we are using <clears throat> our mind, our power of attention, to investigate what we actually are. So we are investigating the very root of all thoughts. The source, <clears throat> from, <clears throat> the root of all thoughts is ego, and the source from which ego and all other thoughts arise is our own is ourself, our own being, I am. So that is what we're investigating. So we we are investigating the root of thought and which leads us to the source of thought, and thereby we remain in that sort we remain in and as that source, thereby we go beyond thought. We we are not just deliberately trying to give up thoughts, because if we just deliberately try to give up thought, we will end up in manolaya. Manolea means a temporary dissolution of mind, like sleep. Our aim is not a temporary dissolution, it is a permanent dissolution that can be brought about only by eradication of ego. And ego is a false awareness of ourself. That is, as ego, we're always aware of ourselves as I am this body, I am this person. That is a false awareness of ourselves because this person is not what we actually are. So, how to remove that false awareness of ourselves? only by being aware of ourselves as we actually are. So knowing ourselves as we actually are is the means to eradicate ego. And eradicating ego is the means to eradicate, to, uh, to move away from all thoughts, to get beyond thoughts, to destroy all thoughts. We, without destroying ego, we cannot destroy thoughts. And without knowing ourselves, we cannot destroy ego. So the aim of self-investigation is to know who am I, not to stop thoughts. If we know who we are, then thoughts will stop thoughts will stop of their own accord. But the aim is, is knowing what we actually are. So we should not be averse to thought. I mean, we, we live in the realm of thought. We can't get away from thought so long as we rise as ego. I, McNair, I hope that's an adequate answer to your question. Do you have anything further you want to ask on that? No, that was good, Michael. I appreciate it. I'm just going to have to listen to your answer several times, I think, to get the deeper meaning of it. But it was it was very helpful. 
And I, I appreciate the example of the map as well. Yes, yes. <laughs> Going on a trip. So thank you. That is, I, I have been studying Bhagavan's teachings now for, um, it's uh, 46, 47 years or so now. I'm, do I'm studying the same work, the same few, uh, as I say, just some 250 verses or so, I'm still learning from these. Because though I know the meaning of these verses, the implication is slow, slowly, slowly it reveals it. In, they, they reveal their implication to us, to the extent to which we go deep in the practice. So yeah, we can oh, never oh. say that we've understood Bhagavan's teachings perfectly. When we've understood his teachings perfectly, we will no longer be here to say, I have understood. When that I goes, that is the perfect understanding of his teachings. Until then, there's always room for, for deeper and clearer understanding. And to gain that deeper and clearer understanding, what is most important is the practice. The, the, the reading his teachings and thinking about them, they are supplementary. They supplement, I mean, they support the practice, but the practice is the key. If we want to really gain a clear and deep understanding of Bhagavan's teachings, going, but practicing self-investigation is the only way, because the, the, the light that illumines the mind, enabling it to know all other things, is the light of pure awareness, I am. When we are practicing self-investigation, we are turning our mind back towards that light, to the source of all clarity. And we are, so to speak, immersing ourselves in that, bathing in that. So, so we we can we can um, we can say self investigation is a, a practice of bathing in the clarity of the pure awareness that we actually are. So, the more we bathe in that clarity, the more our mind will be purified and clarified, and we'll understand these things. Our understanding will become deeper, more refined, and more subtle. Thank We're you. not learning new facts. It's it's understanding that gets deepened. Mm. It's, it's no, not it's knowledge that we're 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 gaining. I mean, it's not knowledge in the sense of information. It's knowledge in the sense of understanding, clarity. Yeah. Thank you. A second question, and I want to ask that as soon as I um, try something a little different by uh, just enumerating two takeaways. Y you talk so well, Michael. You say so much that's important. That And you mentioned this earlier, sometimes we can just sort of glean the significant parts uh, of what we read or what we hear or what you tell us. Uh, my two takeaways, and I underscored because they seem to rise above um, all the other wonderful points you said, was to move away from thought, we need to use our mind. It sounds like a contradiction, but of course it's not. And the second one is, when we know what we are, all thoughts will cease, which I think is of great usefulness to anyone who have. When we that. know what we actually are, ego will cease. And when ego ceases, then only will all thoughts cease permanently. Yeah, <clears throat> excellent. Okay. There's Go a ahead. very nice thing that Bhagavan <clears throat> often used to say. Um, but the same, <clears throat> sorry, but the same power of attention when turned outwards, outwards means away from ourselves, towards other things, is called mind or ego. The same power of attention, when it turns within, it shines as pure awareness. So it's, it, they're, they're not two things here. That is, the mind that we are using to know ourselves is, in essence, it is nothing but ourself. That That is... We call it mind when it's turned outwards, when it when it assumes a form and becomes, a, I am this person, I am this body. But when the same uh, uh, awareness that is now being directed outwards, when it's directed back within towards itself, it dissolves in itself and remains as itself. That is what we actually are. Very practical information. Uh, so when you when you say that we use the mind, yes, we use the mind, but not we're not using the mind as mind because it's mind so long as it's going outwards. We're using we are we are 
turning the mind in on itself. So we are by by turning our attention back on ourselves, we are we are separating ourselves from our mind nature, which is outward going, and uh, um, remaining as our real nature, which is ever inward facing. Well, for, for our real nature, there's no in and out, but uh, from our point of view, we have to say it's always inward facing. It never knows anything other than itself. We are turning our mind back on ourselves. That helps yeah. a whole lot. Okay. Second one here, uh, again from McNair, but it's lengthy, so I'm going to read it to be as succinct as possible. I try to practice self-inquiry when I'm sitting quietly in silence and when I'm up and active in the world. And I have to say I've experienced moments of some joy as a result. I've uh, Yet I've also just as easily or more so experienced frustration when I'm active in the world and forget to engage in self-inquiry, especially when long periods of time go by. Is there something I can do, a suggestion or technique perhaps, to keep self-inquiry more front and center in my consciousness when I'm being active and going about daily life? And I think you touched on this at an earlier time. Uh, yes. Um, that is, um, first, first thing, before I answer the main question, you say, uh, I... I've experienced moments of some joy as a result. Yes, to the extent to which we turn our attention within, we thereby uh, subside. And to the extent to which we subside, the happiness that is our own real nature will shine forth. But so long as we experience that joy as something that comes and goes, sometimes we're experiencing joy, sometimes we're experiencing frustration, Anything that is not permanent is not what we actually are. So it, we are not seeking just a temporary joy. We are seeking the infinite, eternal happiness that we actually are, that it never comes and never goes. So um, we, this is another thing we have to be very clearly aware of in self-investigation. We are not seeking any experience because experiences come and go. We are seeking that which we always know. What we always know is I am. But though we always know I am, what we, we are aware that we are. We are not aware of what we are, because now we are aware of ourselves as I am this body. So long as we are aware of ourselves as I am this body, I am this person, I am McNair, or I am Ted, or I'm Michael, or I'm whoever, we are not aware of ourselves as we actually are. So we, we, we are not seeking to know anything new. We're not seeking to know anything unknown. We are seeking to know what is always known, but more, we are seeking to know it more clearly. Um, so we, we, we shouldn't think that our, our self-investigation is successful if we experience joy. It's unsuccessful if we experience frustration. Both joy and frustration come and go. What it, it is successful to the extent to which we hold on to what is ever shining, namely our own being, I am. Um, it is inevitable when we are, that is the, the nature of the mind is outward going. It is the very nature of the mind to go outward because the mind, the mind means, here means ego. Ego cannot rise, stand or flourish without attending to things other than itself. So it is the very nature of ego to be always going outwards. When we are trying to turn our attention within, we are, we are, we are going against the very nature of ourself as ego um, in order to find our real nature, which it never goes outwards. So um, we, we are, so to speak, swimming against the current. The current of the mind or ego is constantly flowing outwards. We are trying to go within. So we, we will not, all, this is not a path that we're going to, one day sit, we, that we can sit down and attend to ourselves 24-7. It's not like that. So long as the, the 
it, as, until the ego is completely eradicated, there will be fluctuations. Sometimes our attention will be going outwards more. Sometimes it'll be going inwards more. So this is we we just have to accept that this is the nature of the mind. We shouldn't get frustrated. We 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 need to be very very patient with ourselves. We need to be willing to accept any amount of failure. Because without failure, we will never succeed in this path. Failure, that, that is the road to success is paved with failure. If we've never failed, we will never succeed. So we shouldn't be, we shouldn't be, um, we shouldn't be frustrated by the fact that our mind keeps on going outwards. However many times it goes out, outward, we try to bring it back within. Frustration is just a state of mind. It's a state of irritation. Um, we, 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 we're frustrated with ourselves because we are not uh, attending to ourselves more. That is not. That is counterproductive, because that frustration is 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 something other than ourselves. The frustration is not there all the time. Whatever is not ever shining is not ourself. So rather than wasting our time feeling frustrated to whom is this frustration we turn our attention back to ourselves so we shouldn't we shouldn't allow ourselves to to um to to wallow either in frustration or in the temporary joys or, or in any temporary joys we are seeking that which is permanent which which is ever shining but we, that which we always know we are seeking to 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 know our to know what we always know, but to know what we always know as it is, rather than now what we always know is ourself, our own being, I am. But now we don't know I am, we don't know ourself as we actually are, we know ourself as I am this body. So it's, um, we are not seeking anything but we, that is impermanent, anything that comes and goes. We are seeking that which is ever shining. And that is what we should hold on to. So however many times our attention goes outwards, all we have to do is to try to bring it back within. Sometimes it may go outward for a long period of time. As soon as we notice that, uh, that we are not attending to ourselves, rather than getting frustrated, oh, so much time has passed, um, thinking like that, oh, my attention is on other things. To whom are all these other things appearing? Who, who, who am I who am going outwards? We turn our attention back on ourselves. Um, so you say, is there something I can do, a suggestion or technique perhaps, to keep self-inquiry more front and center in my consciousness when I'm being active and going about daily life? There is only one thing you can do. That is persevering the practice. There is no magic technique or suggestion, no, no magic way of doing this. The only way to succeed in this path is by patient and persistent practice. However many times we fall up, fall down, we need to get up. In other words, however many times our attention goes outwards, we need to bring it back within. Only by persistent practice in this way can we succeed. Um, in the... Bhagavan is very, very clear on this in the uh, sixth paragraph of Nana. Um, what he says is, if other thoughts rise without trying to complete them, in other words, without allowing our, my, our attention to be carried away by that thought, without trying to complete them, it is necessary to investigate to whom they have occurred. That means... But as and when each thought arises, rather than allowing our attention to get carried away after that thought, to allow that thought to complete itself, we need to turn our attention back towards ourselves. In other words, we, when he says we need to investigate to whom they have occurred, to whom do all thoughts occur? They occur only to us. So investigating to whom they have occurred means investigating ourselves. It means turning our attention away from the thought back towards ourself, the one to whom the thoughts have uh, occurred. So, as I say, what he says is, if other thoughts rise without trying to complete them, it is necessary to investigate to whom they have occurred. However many thoughts rise, so what? 
That's a very, very important sentence. Bhagavan isn't concerned, he isn't asking us to be concerned about thoughts. He says, however many thoughts rise, so what? Vigilantly, as soon as each thought appears, if one investigates to whom it has appeared, it will be clear to me. If one, so that that is that means if we, when the thought appears, instead of allowing our attention to go after it, if we investigate to whom it has appeared, we're turning our attention back to ourselves, to me, to the one to whom the thought appeared. And having turned our attention back to ourselves, what should we do? We should try to hold hold ourselves, hold our attention on ourselves. That's what he means in the next sentence when he says, if one investigates, who am I? That is, investigating to whom means turning our attention away from whatever appears back towards ourselves, the one to whom it has appeared. Investigating who am I means having turned our attention back to ourselves, we then have to hold ourselves. So what he says in the next sentence is, if one investigates who am I, the mind will return to its birthplace. Investigating who am I means vigilantly attending to ourselves, holding our attention on ourselves, not allowing it to be carried away again by thought. So if we investigate who am I, the mind will return to its birthplace. Uh, the, the term he uses in Tamil for birthplace is piripidum, which literally means birthplace. That, that implies its source, the place from which it arises. So what is the source from which the, the mind arises? In sleep, there is no mind. In waking and dream, there is a mind. So the mind must arise from that which remains in sleep. What remains in sleep is only our self. So we are self of the birthplace of our mind. So when he says the mind will return to its birthplace, it means that we, the, when, by turning our attention to our self, we, the mind, will thereby subside in our own real nature, in the, in 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 what we actually are, which is the source from which we have risen as this mind. And then he he says in the next half of the same sentence, the thought that had arisen will also cease. That is to the extent that ego subsides and dissolves back into its um, source, its attention is thereby withdrawn from other things, and so the thoughts cannot. Uh, cannot um, exist without us being aware of them. The thoughts appear only in our awareness. So if we turn our attention away from the thought, back towards ourself, the one to whom the thought appeared, the thought that had risen will also cease. That is, we will subside and the thought will, and other, whatever thought had arisen will also subside along with us. And then he says in the next sentence, this is a very, very important sentence, when one practices and practices in this manner, for the mind, the power to stand firmly established in its birthplace increases. Here, what, when he says one, one practices and practices, it, in Tamil it's said very, very forcibly, ipidi paraka paraka. Ipidi means in this way, in this manner. Paraka paraka means when one in, when one practices, when one practices, it, it's a repetition to, to put emphasis on the need for this practice. When one, pra when one practices and practices in this manner, for the mind, uh, um, sorry, uh, when one practices and practices in this manner, for the mind, the power to stand firmly established in its birthplace increases. So if you want to avoid the frustration of um, letting your attention go outwards and thereby and uh, noticing it after some time, you need the power to remain firmly established in your, in your birthplace, in other words, in yourself. And to the only way to gain that power, to, to be firm, to hold firmly on to self-attentiveness and thereby to be as we actually are, the only means is by practicing and practicing and practicing in this manner. Practicing and practicing in this manner means however many times our attention goes outwards, we need to turn it back within. So when the, the attention goes outwards, when other things appear in our awareness, to whom do those other things appear? They appear to us. So by by 
by investigating to whom they appear, that means we are turning our attention back towards our self. We then try to hold on to that self-attentiveness. To the extent to which we hold on to self-attentiveness, we thereby subside. And until again, we are we, 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 due to uh, due to inattentiveness. If we allay, again allow our attention to slip outwards, we again need to bring it back. This is the practice. This needs to go on for however long it takes. That is, it, we for countless lives we have been practicing. Um, sending our attention outward, seeking happiness in things other than ourselves. So to overcome that outward going inclination of the mind, the only means is patient and persistent practice of turning our attention back within. No matter how many times the mind goes outwards, as Bhagavan says, however many thoughts rise, so what? However many thoughts rise means however many times the mind goes outwards. So what? As soon as it goes outwards, to whom to whom do all these thoughts appear? To me. And we turn it back within. This is the practice. And it is only by patient and persistent practice that we can succeed. So this is the this is the only way. The the reason to answer this more fully, the reason our mind keeps on going outwards is we we still have strong uh, uh, inclination to seek happiness in things other than ourselves. The inclination to seek happiness in the inclinations to seek happiness in things other than ourselves are what are called bishaya vasanas. Bishayas means objects or phenomena, and in other words, anything other than ourselves and. And um, uh, and vasana means inclination. So the inclination to attend to anything other than ourself is a vishaya vasana. The inclination to attend to ourself is what Bhagavan called sat vasana. Sat means being. So when we are attending to ourself, we are attending to our being. We are attending to I am. So there, there are two types of vasanas. There's the vishaya vasanas that are drawing our attention outwards. The sat vasana is drawing our attention inwards. These vasanas are inclinations. But as a general rule for most of us, our vishaya vasanas are much stronger than our sat vasana, which is why most of the time our attention is going outwards. But vasanas have no strength of their own. Vasanas derive their strength from us. So vasanas are, to the extent to which we allow ourselves to be swayed by any vasana, that vasana is thereby strengthened. We can see that in our daily life. Supposing you have any, any, any weakness, any desire, anything that you like to indulge in. For example, just to give a very simple example, some people smoke cigarettes. Because they uh, because they indulge that inclination to smoke, that inclination becomes stronger and stronger. After some time, they may come to understand that smoking is bad for their health. If they go on smoking, they um, they may get lung cancer, they may get cardiovascular disease, all sorts of health issues may arise. So when they come to know that. They may get an inclination because they've got an inclination to be to uh, take care of their body and to be healthy. They then got two contrary inclinations. On the one hand, there's the inclination to smoke. On the other hand, there's the inclination to be uh, to maintain their health. So, if they give in to the inclination to smoke, that inclination to smoke will get stronger and stronger. If they resist that inclination to smoke and instead uh, um, allow themselves to be swayed by the inclination to maintain their health, the inclination to maintain their health will become stronger and the inclination to smoke will become weaker. This is just the nature of vasanas. So um, we all have countless vasanas. As Bhagavan describes it very beautifully in the tenth paragraph, the first sentence of the tenth paragraph of Nana. He says, though Bishaya vasanas, which come from time immemorial, rise in countless numbers like ocean waves, they will all be destroyed as a swarupa dhyana, that means self-attentiveness, increases and increases. So the 
all Vishaya Basanas, both the good Vishaya Basanas, the Vishaya Basanas to maintain our health, and the bad Vishaya Basanas, like the Basanas to smoke, um, all are taking our attention away from ourselves. The only, ultimately, the only truly good Basana is the Sat Basana. But the inclination to hold on to our being and thereby to be as we actually are. When we are practicing self-investigation, we are we are thereby strengthening the sat vasana and weakening the vishaya vasanas. This is what Bhagavan means when he said in that um, in that uh, passage of Nana that I read. Um, if, uh, by by when one practices and practices in this manner, the strength of the mind to remain established in its birthplace increases. How does it increase? Because by holding on to self-attentiveness, we are strengthening the satvasana. That satvasana is the strength that is required to remain established in our birthplace, in our source. And by the stronger the satvasana becomes, the weaker the vishaya vasanas become. Because when we are when we are holding on to self-attentiveness, the vishaya vasanas will always be trying to pull our attention away from ourselves. We we may feel inclined to think about so many other things, but we try to hold instead of allowing ourselves to be swayed by those inclinations to think of other things, we try to hold on to self-attentiveness. So thereby we are weakening the vishaya vasanas and strengthening the sat vasana. This obviously takes time and it takes practice. So it's these things are not going to, to happen overnight. Ultimately, when we when we when we when the satvasana becomes strong enough, we will eventually turn our attention fully within, and then ego is annihilated, it's all over in a moment. But to reach that point where we're willing to surrender this ego fully by turning our attention within, it takes however much practice is required. It may take it may take days, months, years, lifetimes, it doesn't matter. That is, how long it takes us to reach our goal depends on how far we've come along this journey. So if we haven't till now been practicing self-investigation, we've still got quite a long way to go. But we have to, the only way to, to travel this final leg of our journey is by the practices of self-investigation. So we should start here and now. And however many times we fail, however many times our attention goes outwards, however many times we get carried away by our vishaya vasanas, we should turn our attention back towards ourselves and try to hold on to self-attentiveness. We should not give in to frustration. Frustration is again a thought. It's a it's 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 a vishaya vasana, but it, it but inclines us to get frustrated. So long as we're frustrated, we're not attending to ourselves. We're attending to that feeling of frustration. So to whom is this frustration? To me. Who am I? We turn our attention back towards ourselves. That obviously doesn't mean we have to question like that. We have to investigate to whom. So in, frustration is for whom? It's for me. So investigating to whom is this frustration means investigating myself, turning my attention back to myself. McNair, does that adequately answer that question of yours? Yes, thank you, Michael. I appreciate it. Right. Yes. Okay. Want to go on? Uh, uh, we have a... Shall we see if anyone else has any questions before we go on to the other well, questions? Well, I have a question that's a follow-up on what you've been saying. And okay, been good. However, uh, since I'm the facilitator here, I think I'm the only one allowed to ask a stupid question. And this one is just that, but yeah. it's about self-investigation. Mm. Uh, you've said a lot that's been very useful in one whole hour with two questions. And that was the that was the takeaway of this second answer more than anything else. Preserve in the practice of self-inquiry. Persevere. Persevere in the practice of self-inquiry. Yeah which is easy to do if you remember to do it. <laughs> but many of us, like McNair pointed out, in the rush of the day, forget to do it. Turning our attention, you say, Michael, back to ourself over and over yeah. and over again in the form of self-investigation yeah. is key. My stupid question is this. How much can we investigate ourselves? We're simple beings. Some of us have been here 40 years, some longer. 
Yeah. Uh, how much can we expect to learn of ourselves as we go back to self-investigation over and over again? We just... <laughs> we just have to persevere. That is, we, we are all failing. We are all failing daily. We're getting carried away by thoughts. We have so many concerns uh, about things other than ourselves. But it doesn't matter how many times we fail, as Bhagavan says, however many thoughts rise, so what? Our aim is to turn our attention back to ourselves. So it doesn't matter how many times we fail, we need to pick ourselves up and continue on the journey. The journey means turning our attention back within. It's just that sometimes I feel like I've uncovered all the nuggets and the black boulders of my life. And it's hard to imagine that there still might be more lurking there if only I look deeper. If you go, the deeper you go, the more you will find, the more dirt you will find. But that dirt is not what we're looking for. That, that is, what is the light that is illumining all that dirt? That is what we are, should be attending to. But Thank also, you. as Bhagavan said, all that is inside has to come out. Because if it doesn't come out, you cannot get rid of it. So it's, it's part of the process, all these vasanas rising up to the surface of the mind. But the only way to overcome these vasanas is to not allow ourselves to be swayed by them. So as we persevere more and more in this practice, we are immersing ourselves more and more in that clarity. And we, it, it's, we, we must immerse ourselves in that clarity until we lose ourselves in it completely. So how long must this continue? So long as we remain here as, <laughs> as, as, a, as ego, as something that uh, is a, a, a aware of itself as I am this person and is consequently aware of so many other things, so long the investigation is necessary. Well put. Thank you. Right. Uh, I'll, I'll take you up on your offer to have other questions come, but since I already mentioned Dharma is the next has the next question, and it's a brief one, right. maybe we can address this and then we'll open it up to other people. Right. Dharma Bungaroo writes, Meditation on the divine sound, on the sound, is meditation of Nada Brahma, the divine sound, Om. Is meditation, this is his question, is meditation on the sound ever recommended by Ramana? No, no, uh, it, is, um, uh, it is not, because the sound Om, what is important with the sound Om is what is that the sound om is a word. What is that word referring to? It is a word that refers to Brahman. Brahman means our own real nature. So, the, the, but as Bhagavan said, um, the first and foremost mantra, the first and foremost name of God, let's say, is I. Om is only secondary to that. So Bhagavan used to sometimes say, I is the elder brother, Om is the younger brother. Because do, though Om refers to our own real nature, do any of us go around us around referring to ourselves as Om? Om is sitting here, Om is talking. No, we naturally refer to ourselves as I. So, um, but even Bhagavan didn't even recommend for those who had difficulty grasping what is self-attention, he sometimes said, even if you go on thinking I, I, it will lead to that, that place. That means that resource, the birthplace of the mind. Um, when, he, when he said that, what he meant by that is, when we say the word I, the word I refers to what? It refers to ourself. So every word refers to something. When we mention a word, it brings to our mind that to which it refers. So if I say um, New York, it brings a certain city to our mind. If I mention ocean, it brings a vast body of water to our mind. If I say apple, it brings a certain fruit to our mind. If I say running, it brings a certain activity to, to the mind. When we say om, Sorry, when we say I, that I word I, if if whatever it doesn't matter which language it is, if we if English happens to be our mother tongue, then I. 
if our mother tongue happens to be French, then it's je. If it's Spanish, then yo. If it's uh, Sanskrit, then aham. If it's uh, Tamil, it's nan. There are so many different words, but whatever book is not the word that is important. What is that word referring to? It's referring to ourself. So by 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 um, um, thinking of that word, that draws our attention back to ourselves. Just like thinking the word apple brings a certain object to our mind, a certain fruit to our mind, thinking the word I uh, brings to our mind that which the word I refers to. So Bhagavan is not recommending re meditating on the sound I or the sound om, but on what those sounds refer to. That is our self. Um, there is a... Wait a second, I'll just find it. Um, there is uh, the teaching, but um, but Bhagavan. Wait a second. Um, um, just getting. Um, <clears throat> there's an incident in Bhagavan's life that you may be aware of. There was a a person called Kavya Ganta Ganapati Sastri. He was a, a great poet in Sanskrit. And he, um, from a young age, he wanted to do tapas. The aim for which he wanted to do tapas, tapas means uh, austerity. He thought that um, his aim was uh, to gain Shakti and Siddhis, powers, um, because he wanted to do good in the world, what he thought was good in the world. So he wanted to rest restore the Vedic Dharma and to drive the British out of India and to establish righteousness in the world. He had so many ambitions like that. And he thought that if he does tap us, he will be able to gain that power. So um, he was for a long time doing tapas, particularly mantra japa he was doing, um, in order to gain this power. Um, he had uh, he had heard about Bhagavan some years before, some three or four years earlier, he had heard about Bhagavan, but some young Swami sitting, sitting on the hill, he wasn't much interested. But on that particular day, he happened to be in Tiruvannamalai, and he happened to be very frustrated because he didn't seem to be getting anywhere in, with all his mantra japa and all his other sadhanas. So he came to Bhagavan. And uh, he climbed up the hill and he saw Bhagavan sitting outside Virupaksha cave. He prostrated himself before Bhagavan and he said something to a following effect. I've studied all the Vedas and numerous other books. I've done countless crores, that is uh, tens of millions of, uh, of uh, mantra japa, that's repetition of mantras. I fasted and eaten very little. Yet what is it that is actually meant by tapas is still not clear to me. Graciously explain to me what tapas really is. At first, Bhagavan just kept quiet and silently gazed at, at him. But after about 15 minutes, Kabyaganta said, I've read in books about such chakshu diksha, that's initiation by sight, but I cannot grasp the truth that is taught thereby. So graciously explain in words. Um, Bhagavan then said, um, the meaning of what he said, he said in Tamil, nan nan embadu enge irundu purupadu kirado ade gavnetal manam ange linamahum aduve tapas. That means if one attentively observes that from where what says I, I goes out, there the mind will be dissolved. That alone is tapas. The reason Bhagavan framed his the answer like that is, Kavya Ganta's question was, I have studied all the Vedas. I have done so much mantra japa. I have fasted. I have done this. I have done that. So what Bhagavan says is, if one attentively observes that from where, what says I, I goes out. So what is it that is saying, I, 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 I have done this, I have done that? That is ego. From where does that ego go out? It, only from ourself. That is, ego cannot arise from anything other than ourself. 
Because what, as I mentioned earlier, what remains in sleep is only our self, our self in the sense of our being, I am. That is what we actually are. Only from, ego rises only in waking and dream. So it must rise from something that is there in its absence. In the absence of ego, what remains is only ourself. So ego rises from ourself, from our own being. So attending to, attentively observing that from where what says I, I goes out means attentively observing ourself, the source from which ego has risen. And he says, if one attentively observes that, in, in other words, if one attentively observes oneself, there the mind will be dissolved. That alone is tapas. In other words, Bhagavan is saying self-attentiveness alone is tapas. And by self-attentiveness, the mind will subside and dissolve back in its source. That is the implication. In many books, it is said, but Bhagavan then gave a second answer. But the, Bhagavan didn't give the second answer of his own accord. The reason Bhagavan gave the second answer is that when Kabiraganta heard this first answer, he was bewildered because this was something, though he'd read so many books, he'd read the study of the Vedas and the Upanishads and the Tantras and um, so many uh, different books he had studied, never had he come across a teaching so simple and clear as this. So he was a bit bewildered by it, by the unfamiliarity of this teaching. So he asked, is it not possible to attain that state even by mantra japa? So in reply to that second question, Bhagavan said, um, the, the meaning of what Bhagavan said is, uh, well, I'll just read the Tamil for those who know Tamil, oru mantra te japam panninal and the mantra dvani enge irndu purupadi kiradu endru gavnetal manam ange linam akiradu adu tan tapas. The meaning of that is if one goes, sorry, if one does japa of a mantra, in other words, if one repeats a mantra, if one attentively observes from where that mantra sound goes out, there the mind is dissolved. That itself is tapas. So has Bhagavan given a second technique here? No. Because if we pay close attention to what he says, he says if one does japa of a mantra, if one attentively observes from where that mantra sound comes out, goes out. So if you are doing japa, if you're mentally repeating a mantra, from where is that mantra sound coming? It's coming only from you. So when he says, if one attentively observes from where that mantra sound goes out, he means if you attentively observe yourself, there the mind is dissolved. That itself is tapas. So actually, this second teaching, what Bhagavan is teaching in the second teaching, is exactly the same that he taught in the first teaching. But in both cases, he's saying that we should attend to ourself, the source from which ego and everything else arises. And if we attend to ourselves, the source from which all these things rise, the mind will be dissolved there, everything else will be dissolved with, along with it, and that alone is tapas. In other words, the subsidence of ego is alone tapas, and the subsidence of ego can be achieved only by self-attentiveness. So, um, why I brought up this now in relation to this question, because the question is whether Bhagavan recommended meditation on the sound OM. No. E even if people wanted to do to, to do japa of the sound OM, Bhagavan would say what you should attend to is the source from which that sound is coming. That source is yourself. Uh, so, Bhagavan, the sound, though the sound, um, the sound om refers to Brahman, like all words, it's something other than ourself. Even the word I is something other than ourself. That's why Bhagavan didn't ask us to meditate on the word I, but uh, he said you can think the word I, but the intention is to meditate on ourselves, what the word I refers to.
And in other places, Bhagavan says, without even uttering the word I by mouth or by even mentally uttering the word I, the, the mind should uh, go deep within. So the, the true meditation, the meditation taught by Bhagavan is only Swarupa Dhyana, meditation on our own real nature. Um, the reason that well, a lot can be said to explain why Om is uh, is a word is a mantra, but refers to Brahman. There's a significance in it because the sound Om, though it is, it consists of one vowel and one consonant. The one vowel that it consists of, which is the long O, is actually a combination of two vowel sounds merged together. Those two mouse vowel sounds are R and oo, and the consonant is m. So if you repeat the word om, you, you begin with the mouth open, then the mouth slowly closes and uh, is fully closed with the m. That, what that represents, the, the, the r, the open mouth, that is the rising of all creation. The oh, oo is the sustenance, the m, is the dissolution, the subsidence of everything. And what remains after Om is silence. That is our real nature. So uh, there, 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 there are so many reasons. I mean, there's a lot of significance to this word Om. But Bhagavan does not recommend we should meditate on Om. He meditates on we, but he recommends that we should meditate on we on that to which the word om refers, that is ourself. Because words come and go. We ourselves remain. So Bhagavan didn't recommend meditating on any words. For example, some people, because it is said, but you are Brahman, uh, 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 you are that, and Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahman. Some people think that the way to know ourselves is to meditate, I am Brahman or I am consciousness, or I am the self, or people say all sorts of things. That is not what Bhagavan recommends. Bhagavan says, but what is the purpose of the Mahavakya? You are that. Till now, we have been looking for that. That means Brahman, or knowledge, or happiness, or whatever we're looking for. We take that to be something other than ourselves. So the Vedas say, you are that. Why do they say you are that? Because we, we cannot find what we are looking for by looking outside. What we are looking for is nothing other than ourselves. So they say, you are that, in order to turn our attention away from looking outside to looking back within. So if you are that means you are Brahman. If Brahman is ourself, we shouldn't be meditating, I am Brahman. Because so long as we don't know Brahman, the word Brahman is just for us, it's a thought. We've got some idea. Brahman means something very vast, very big, the infinite whole. It's just an idea. So if we think I am Brahman, we are meditating on ourselves. But I am this idea called Brahman. We are not meditating on Brahman as it actually is. What Brahman actually is, is I am. So if you want to meditate on Brahman, you should meditate only on I am. That doesn't mean on the words I am what the words I am refer to, in other words, your own being. So Bhagavan, the only meditation that Bhagavan recommended of his own accord is meditating on ourself, because that's the only way to know ourself. So long as we meditate on any words, uh, such as Om or Aham Brahmasmi or anything, our attention is on something other than ourself. So long as we're attending to something other than ourself, we cannot know ourself. We need to attend to ourself alone. So this is the only meditation Bhagavan recommended of his own accord. However, if you had gone to Bhagavan and you had said, Bhagavan, I've been practicing, I've been meditating on Om for many years. Uh, is this practice good? Bhagavan would say, oh yes, very good. Because Bhagavan doesn't give us a, Bhagavan doesn't give teachings of his own accord. If we are satisfied with what we are doing, but one will encourage us. Oh, yes, yes, very, very good, very good, very good. If you, but if you come to Bhagavan and say, Bhagavan, I've been, I've been meditating on Om for so many years, but I don't seem to be getting anywhere. 
Then Bhagavan will ask, who is it who is meditating on Om? Meditate on that one who is med- who was med- meditate on the meditator. That will so he would if we ask him, he would that this is what he will say. But if we don't ask, if we just if we are satisfied with what we are doing, if we say, Oh Bhagavan, I'm doing uh, mantra japa or I'm doing puja, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, Bhagavan will say, Very good, very good. Because he's not going to he's not going to so long as we're satisfied with what we're doing. He will encourage us in that way. Only when we are dissatisfied and we come to him and say, Bhagavan, this doesn't seem to be getting me anywhere, then he'll say, you need not go anywhere. Know yourself. That's all. There's no place to go other than yourself. But, but our goal is the point from which we started. The point from which we started is ourself. We, 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 we have risen as ego from ourself. We need to return to ourself. That's why sometimes Bhagavan used to say, go the way you came. There's a story. Once some per- person came from a faraway place and, Bhagavan, and came to Bhagavan and said, Bhagavan, I want to know the way. I, I, I've, um, I've studied so much about spirituality and everything, but it's still not clear to me what is the way, what is the way forward. Um, uh, how am I to know myself or something? I don't know exactly what he asked Bhagavan. Bhagavan replied, go the way you came. That person was a bit put out. I come all this distance to ask him and he just told me to tell, go the way you came. So he was feeling a bit upset and he came out of the hall. And he said, see, I've come all this distance and he just says to me, go the way you came. And then that person he said it to explained to him, no, no, what Bhagavan means, has a, what Bhagavan said has a very deep meaning. From where have we come? We have risen from ourselves. We've risen as ego. We, um, from ourselves, we need to go back the way we came. In other words, we need to go back within. So, uh, Dharma, I hope that um, that is a satisfactory answer to your question. Do you have any further questions you want to ask on that? Yeah, but the OM I'm referring to is not the OM that I chant because I have never done OM chanting. The OM in me is being listened. It, it is here 24, 7, 365 days, wherever I am. The OM is with me. But Om is with you. So there are two things. There's you and Om. Sorry? There are two things then. If Om is always with you, then there are two mm-hmm. things. There's you and there's Om. Yeah. Yeah, there is there is this uh, this so, uh, kind of duality here. But yes. If you that... but but truth is Om is one without a second. Ekam eva advaitium. Om is, Om, is, Om is Brahman. That is you. So long mm-hmm. as you think there's a, a division between you and Om, then that is not what Om actually is. You yourself are Om. If you want to know Om, know yourself. But I don't need to know because it is with me. I experience it all the time. Anything that is with you is something other than you. Okay. And so long as it's, uh, if it's something other than you, it's not you. You need to know yourself. And is Om with you in sleep? Uh, no. No. I don't think. No. So, but as anything... soon as I'm wake, as soon as I'm wake up, yeah. Oh, I'm my sleep is broken. It is here. Okay. Everywhere so... it is. Okay, okay, but still, it it's not there with you in sleep, but you are of in course. sleep. So anything that appears and disappears is it's not real. what is real. What is real is what is constantly shining. So you yeah. alone are what are constantly shining. Mm-hmm. That is no, why because... Bhagavan said we should investigate ourselves. Anything other the... than ourselves. The reason the reason I pose this question is when I wake up in the morning, the first thing is I can hardly do anything. I am just carried away with this own sound and I'm in I go into deep meditation. Okay. Who is so, carried away? Who is carried away? I don't by that? know. 
I, I don't know. That is what, this... why you need to investigate yourself. Okay. So, yeah, I do why, it. But I, the but I, answer Bhagavan gave to Kavyaganta. The second answer is very relevant here. You say you're not you're not repeating Om. Okay, that Om is there. No. That 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 Om is with you. But it is with me right now. But who is it who is aware of that Om? Yeah, that would be the question. If you investigate the one who is aware of Om, the one to whom Om appears. There, the mind will be dissolved. That is tapas. But but the Om is coming from eternity. If it's coming from eternity, then how does it disappear in sleep? Whatever is, is eternal, whatever is eternal, must be present in sleep. The only thing that is eternal is you. But I don't know if it is if it is present in sleep or not. Because you don't, if you don't know it, if it's not self shining, you are self shining, you know, you were there in sleep, yeah, sure. So, why leave the first thing and go for a second thing? You are the first thing, you are the thing, you are the only thing that is eternal. Whatever yes. appears and disappears is not eternal, okay. If you know what you are, then you will know what Om is. Because Om is your own, Om is a name for your own real nature. Yes. You yourself are the import of Om. What Om is referring to is you yourself. So know yourself and you'll know the reality of Om. You'll know the reality of everything. Good. Move on, Dine. Move on. Yeah. Yeah, you can move yeah. on. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Short question, good answer, very thorough. Uh, yeah, but short questions don't work with me. <laughs> However short the question, I'll still find some reason to give a long answer. Well, I, I, I agree because it's one of the biggest hills I've ever had to go across on the path to non-duality to give up my affection, my love my desire, my wants to be with the God outside of myself that yes. I was raised to know. Yes. Not there. Uh, so his is a similar question along the same line there. We have, you said to take other questions here. We have two questions from people who use the text format. I see there's another one down there too. Uh, Ali and Vitali. Uh, Ali, if, if you're ready, we'll go with yours, but uh, try to make it succinct. I'm not sure if I understood it. As correctly as you want me to, or he wants you to. Sure. Uh, yeah, I can. Uh, I, I can rephrase it. Uh, hello, Michael. Thank you. Hi. Thank you for everything. Um, so uh, I, I've heard many of your videos. I uh, I've been following Ramana uh, for for a few years now, and it's uh, as you you've said many times, it's very simple, uh, right? And and time and time again, you remind us to essentially uh investigate ourselves right um and and what i found is there are two type of questions one about let's say clarifying the practice and so on which i consider to be useful and there are other type of questions which are like curiosity questions like is there reincarnation or how did the world came to be or whatever the case mm -hmm. those are questions that i don't find as useful uh mm -hmm. again they are just curiosity I wonder if that's truly the case because I, I've been, you know, just focusing on obviously improving my practice. Uh, is there any any benefit from these curiosity questions? Um, it depends on the benefit lies in what type of answer is given. Bhagavan always Bhagavan talked about how the world originated, but the answer he gave was a very practical answer, but draw our attention back to ourselves. The world appears to whom? It appears to us. The, the world appears when we rise as ego. It disappears when we subside. So ego, the, the world is an object. Who is the subject who knows that object? It is ego. What is the reality of that ego? That is what we actually are. That is, the world, 
derives it, the world seems to exist only in the view of ourself as ego. So the world derives its semi existence from the semi existence of ourself as ego. And from where do, does ego derive its semi existence? Only from the real existence of ourself. So the we ourself are the reality that appears as ego, and ego is what sees itself as the world. So if if they, these answers are if these questions are answered properly, it's all pointing us back to the same thing. In for example, in Uludunapdu, some of the early verses of Uludunapdu, Bhagavan talks about the world. But all those verses, he's pointing our attention back towards ourselves. He says in verse four, he says, uh, well, in the very first verse, he says, because we see the world. Uh, ex uh, um, accepting that they, uh, um, accepting that there's one, but there's one thing that has a power to appear as many is the one best option. That one thing is ourself. I mean, he goes on to say the 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 picture of names and forms, in other words, the world, the um, the screen on which it appears the light by which it appears, and the seer, all these are only he, meaning that one, that one reality, which is oneself. So there he's turning our attention away from the appearance of the world back towards ourself. But because the world appears to whom? To us. So that's why he says the, the first three words are nam means we, ullahum means world, Kandalau means because of seeing, because we see the world. So the world is known by us because of seeing. But we, we without 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 knowing, without that like seeing it, seeing there means perception. Without perceiving, there could be nothing perceived. And without a perceiver, there can neither be perceiving nor anything perceived. So the world and the seeing of the world depend upon us, the seer of the world, the perceiver of the world, the knower of the world. But even the we who see this are something that appear and disappear. We appear in waking and dream, we disappear in sleep. We means we as ego, the seer. But though we as ego disappear in sleep, we still remain in sleep as we actually are. So we are the reality. So these questions are useful to understand this, because otherwise, so long as we think the world has some independent existence, it may have something, some existence independent of ourselves. It may have something to offer us. When we understand that the world has no existence of its own, it derives its semi existence from ourselves because it appears only in our view, then there's nothing the world has to offer us. So instead of looking outwards, we need to look within to our own reality. That is great. Uh, thank you, Michael. I appreciate right. it. But you're you're dead right. But ultimately, uh, these any question or any answer is useful only to the extent to which it draws our attention back to ourselves and impresses upon us when us the need to investigate ourselves. Correct. Yeah. Thank you. Right. And uh, real quickly, Michael, because I keep getting hung up on this very fine point. Do we need to turn back to ourselves to investigate ourselves or to turn back and to recognize ourselves? I mean, I, I can turn back and repeat to my mind, I am, I am, I am that, nothing other than that. Or I can go to the route of investigating more. There's always some confusion in the minds of people I we talk to. We Mind. can recognize ourselves as we actually are only by investigating ourselves. Now we wrongly recognize ourselves as I am Ted or I am Michael. That is a wrong recognition of ourselves. We want to recognize ourselves as we actually are. In order yes. to recognize ourselves as we actually are, we need to see ourselves as we actually are. To see ourselves as we actually are, we need to look at ourselves. 
Look at ourselves means we need to attend to ourselves and thereby know ourselves as we actually are. Yeah. So the investigation is nothing but looking at ourselves, observing ourselves, watching, uh, attending to ourselves. That helps. It's the word investigation, which I love, yeah. having been an investigative reporter for 44 years. Uh, yeah. But it doesn't literally necessarily mean to go digging into your past to figure out who you are and where you came from. We're not digging into the past. We're digging into the present. Okay, the present. Who we were in the past, we're least concerned about. Who we are in the future, we're least concerned about. Who am I here and now? It's our being that we're investigating. Thank you, thank you, thank what you. What changes over time is identity. Some yeah. 60, 70 years ago, we were small children. Now we are old men. So what we were in the past, is, it, 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 that is what we are over time changes. That's our identity. We are not investigating our identity. We're investigating our being, what we actually are. Got it. The same I that was aware of itself, as I am little Ted playing with my toys, is the same I that is now aware of itself as I am Ted. I've spent so many years as an investigative journalist. The, the, the identity has changed, but the I that identifies itself is the same. Thank you. Thank you. Vitaly <laughs> is next, and he was patient enough to wait and hold on to his question. Let's hear it, Vitaly. Yeah. Hi, Michael. Um, yeah. I... I uh, kind of asked that question earlier, back when we had a um, conversation over the uh, Skype, uh, not Skype, the chat, and um, I, I probably had to rephrase that a little bit better. And again, it's uh, it's more like a curiosity, like the previous uh, question was, but um, when we're in sleep, everything gets suspended, right? And um, only I am remain, it remains. Yes. So after awakening, everything, our name, thoughts, feelings, uh, everything that we left off before we went to sleep kind of restores back yeah. to whatever we, whatever it was left off. Yes. Did uh, Ramana ever explain this phenomenon? Where, where is this? If it was suspended, it comes back. It, yeah. it has to be um, some some continuity um, that that um, re remains with all this coming back to us every morning that we wake up or after the sleep. Yes, that is the continuity is I. That is the root. That is the the essential continuity is I. I means in this case it's ego. Ego comes back, and ego brings along with it its vasanas. And the whole show continues. Um, so, it, and the whole of our present life is one dream. So our identity remains the same. So yesterday um, you were Vitaly. Today, when you woke up this morning, you were Vitaly. When you wake up again tomorrow morning, you're going to be Vitaly. You're the same. You, your identity remains the same. But what actually remains in sleep is nothing but I am. Then people say, oh, but if, if nothing, if only I am remains, how the same ego comes back again? If ego ceases to exist in sleep, how does it come back again? That is not a question that need concern us. Because that is like, that is akin to the question, another question that people ask, how did this ego come into existence in the first place? Why did ego come into existence in the first place? These are questions that cannot be answered. When people used to ask Bhagavan this question, Bhagavan would say, okay, first you find that ego and bring it to me, and then we can find out how or why it came into existence. If we, if we investigate this ego, if we try to find it, it will take flight, it'll run away, it'll disappear. But there's no such thing. We seem to be ego only so long as we're looking outwards. If we look within, has anyone ever seen such a thing as ego? 
There's no such thing to be found. We seem to be ego only when we don't look at ourselves. When we look at ourselves, there is no ego to be found. Since ego doesn't actually exist, to explain how it came into existence, why it came into existence is irrelevant. That is applicable not only to why it first came into existence, but why it comes into existence every morning when we wake up from sleep. However, not everyone is satisfied with this answer. So they persist in asking, oh, no, no, but then there must be, it must have existed in some form in sleep. Otherwise, how can it come back again? Then the usual answer that is given in most of the texts is that in sleep we remain in a seed form. That is, ego and all its vasanas remain in a seed form. And then they come back again. Only such an answer will satisfy some people. That seed form is what is called the karana sarira. But if you say that you exist as the karana sarira in sleep, a karana sarira means the causal body. The causal body is made up of all the vasanas. So if you remain as the causal body in sleep, the, the causal body continues in waking and dream because the vasanas are with us now. We're very well aware of the vasanas now. So the causal body is there. If we say the causal body is there in all the three states, then what reason do we have to suppose that we're anything other than the causal body? So then I may be just a bundle of vasanas, but subsides in sleep and remains in sleep, form in sleep and rises up again in waking. But uh, the same Vedanta that teaches us but we remain in sleep in the form of causal body, it also analyzes the three states and says in sleep you alone remain. Therefore you are not any of these other things. So there's a logical inconsistency there. So the truth is in sleep, are we aware of anything other than ourselves in sleep? We're not aware of vasanas, we're not aware of the world, we're not aware of the body, we're not, we're not aware of ourselves as I am Vitaly, I am Michael, I am anyone. We, the, the, so uh, Bhagavan, the simple answer given by Bhagavan, in, in ego there is no, e, sorry, in sleep there is no ego, no mind, no ego, in any form whatsoever. What exists in sleep is only ourself. Why did ego then wake, uh, uh, rise up in the morning? Investigate and see whether ego has risen now. If you investigate to see whether it exists now, you'll find that it never actually came into existence at all. So the question of how or why becomes irrelevant. That is, but we need to be very, we need Viveka. Viveka means uh, discrimination, judgment, uh, a clear discernment. So we need to apply this Viveka to what questions are useful to ask and what questions are not useful to ask. Asking what we actually are or who we actually are is a useful question to ask. And it's a, not, we shouldn't just ask the question, we should investigate to find out what we actually are. But asking why all this has appeared, how it has all appeared, these are not useful questions, because it, it's giving reality to all these things. If you're saying, how did ego rise in the morning? Why does all this appear? You're, you're, you're giving a reality to these things. Whereas these things have no reality whatsoever. They are just appearances, and they appear only in the form of view of ego. And in whose view does ego appear? Only in the view of ego. So if ego investigates itself to see what it is, it will cease to be ego and remain as it actually is. And then all questions become irrelevant. Otherwise, if we begin seeking to answer these things, question, there will be endless questions. This is why philosophy, if you read... The, all the philosophy books in the world would fit many, many libraries. So much philosophy has been written, so many philosophical questions have been written because of the outward going mind. So we, we need to decide what are we here for? Are we, do we want to have satisfactory answers to everything? Or do we want to 
know and be what we actually are. If we know and remain as we actually are, there will be nothing to ask any questions about. So long as we continue asking questions about anything other than ourselves, we, we, we are allowing our mind to go outwards and it is endless. It's endless. There's no, they, no philosophy or science is ever going to get to the end of the outward search for knowledge. You can go on searching for knowledge outwardly and, and you'll be learning more and more and more and more. But what happens to all that knowledge when you fall asleep? What happens to one who has all that knowledge when you fall asleep? That one who, who has all this knowledge gained in the waking state ceases to exist in sleep. So what value does that knowledge have? And one day that it's going to also cease to exist in death. Then we're never going to remember again what all that we learned. We're going to have to learn it all over again. So we, we need to seek that which is permanent. What is permanent is only ourself. Is, that a, is this a satisfactory answer or not? Yes, absolutely. Yes, thank you so much. Right. Appreciate it. Right. So let's take a look at the calendar at the clock on the wall. Uh, tough spot for an old radio and TV guy because you try to make it right up on the hour. Quick question time, very brief question, succinct question. Maybe we'll get a long answer. Maybe we'll get a brief one. But who would like to ask a quick question? Thank you, Ted. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to ask a question. Um, Michael, I have a question just real quick, please. If I am trying, um, for example, to resolve karma, um, so um, I, I'm I'm aware that maybe there's not much action I can take with Sanchita. It just is perhaps um, my parabda. Perhaps I can have I can reframe my thought on that. What I'm experiencing with it, what's passing through this, um, and then in terms of the agamia. Um, is it recommended that I can take godlike action? That's my question. Um, so long as we rise as ego, we we are to a great we to a greater or lesser extent act under the sway of our vishaya basanas. That is, we act by thought, word, and deed under the sway of our vishaya basanas. Those actions we do under the sway of our vishaya basanas by, by mind, speech, or body are agamya. So agamya is inevitable so long as we rise as ego. If we want to put an end, if we want to refrain from doing agamya, we need to refrain from rising as ego. To refrain from rising as ego, we need to hold on to self-attentiveness. But the means to, the, and that, that, that holding on to self-attentiveness is the only means to resolve uh, all karma. Um, Bhagavan has explained this very nicely in verse 38 of Uludunapadu. What he says in verse 38 is, um, if we are the doer of actions, we will have to experience the resulting fruit. Uh, we are the doer of action so long as, uh, sorry, that's the first sentence. I'm now just explaining that. We are the doer of action so long as we rise as ego. Because when we rise as ego, we identify the bundle of five sheaths as I. That means we the, the actions done by body are actions done by me. The actions done by speech are actions done by me. The actions done by mind are actions done by me. I am thinking, I am talking, I am sitting, standing, walking, or whatever. So all we, we, we identify with the actions of these instruments because we have risen as ego. So we have a doer of action so long as we rise as ego. Consequently, we have to experience the fruit of the actions. 
But then he goes on to say in the next sentence, uh, when one knows oneself by investigating who is the doer of action, uh, doership will depart and all the three karmas will come to an end. What does he mean by that? Who is the doer of action is ego. If we investigate ego, we will then know ourselves. We, not, we are not ego, but we have a reality underlying ego. If you look carefully at the snake, you will know the rope. You will see the rope. Likewise, if we look carefully at ego, we will see what we actually are, because we are the underlying reality. But we are, we are what, appear, what is now mistakenly appears, or we, what we mistakenly see as ego, uh, is what we actually are. That is our reality. We are the underlying reality of ego. So if we if we investigate the doer of action, in other words, if we investigate ego, we will thereby know ourselves. When we know ourselves, ego is thereby destroyed because ego is a false awareness of ourself. So long as you're aware of yourself as I am Leah, that which is aware of itself as I am Leah is ego. So that which is aware of itself as I am this or I am that is ego. When we are aware of ourselves as we actually are, we can no longer mistake ourselves to be anything else. So ego is thereby annihilated. Ego is a false awareness of ourself. When we are aware of ourselves as we actually are, that false awareness is destroyed. When ego is destroyed, since ego is the doer, the doership is also destroyed. Since ego is the experiencer, the experiencer is also devoid, uh, also uh, destroyed. When, the, when, when there's no doer and no experiencer, how can there be any of the three karmas? You need a doer to do a gamya. You need an experiencer to experience the fruit of that gamya in the form of prarabdha. Uh, so, uh, and the Sanchitra is only for that same, uh, waiting in store for that same ego. So when ego is destroyed, all the three karmas are destroyed. That is the only way to resolve ego, uh, uh, resolve karma. Otherwise, so long as we rise as ego, we continue doing actions and experiencing the fruit. So it's okay a clear to answer? try. Hmm? It, it is a clear answer. I, I guess what I'm trying to like, break it down and say there are people and things i don't like yeah fundamentally yeah and i'm trying to resolve that by not playing god and not kissing ass but just trying to act right and treat these people and things that i don't like in a godlike way my question is is that okay uh yes in, in as far as action is concerned but to whom are the likes and dislikes? Rather than being concerned about how you should behave, if you investigate yourself, you are you are thereby defusing that the likes and dislikes. That is, the problem lies not in those people you dislike. The problem lies in your dislike of them. If you had no likes or dislikes, nobody would disturb you. It's because we have likes and dislikes that we are disturbed by people. So the problem doesn't lie in most people. The problem lies in us. So to whom are those likes and dislikes? To me, if we turn our attention within, we thereby uh, uh, cut, cut, the, cut the ground from underneath the likes and dislikes. The likes and dislikes can stand only so long as we rise as ego. By investigating ourselves, we subside, and our likes and dislikes subside along with us. So to the extent to which we follow this practice of self-investigation, our likes and dislikes, they will still remain, but they will lose their force. So we'll be, though we may still dislike this person and that person, we'll be not bothered about it. Okay, it's not, that, that person isn't the problem. I am the problem having these likes and dislikes. So we keep on turning our attention back on ourselves, and thereby we will automatically behave appropriately. Because when the, when the, 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 the force behind that, those likes and dislikes, when that is, when 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 they lose their force, their momentum, 
we will automatically behave in an appropriate way. Thank you. I'm glad I asked. Otherwise, no. if we try and say, oh, should I act like this? Should I act like that? We, we, our attention is still going outwards and we, we will continue making the same mistakes. The only way to free yourself from the likes and dislikes is to investigate what you actually are. So long and as you allow your attention to go outwards, the likes and dislikes will remain. Yeah. And in AA, we ask God to remove it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Understood. Gotcha. Thank mm. you. Right. And in this group, we find out who God is. <laughs> yes. It begins with a capital S. Uh, really, this is wonderful. And I'm glad she asked that question because when it comes up to me, I think it's like a drop dead. There you are. The answer's in your hand. Just use it. And whom are these disagreeable people appearing? Ah, yeah. yes, they're appearing in me. Yeah. In, in the 19th paragraph of uh, Nana, Bhagavan, Bhagavan says very nicely, right now, I'll just get that, um, that paragraph. Um, it's a good place to end. Yeah. He says, there are not two minds, namely a good mind and a bad mind. That means they're not two types of mind, two, two different kinds of minds, good mind and bad mind. Mind is only one. Only vasanas are of two kinds, namely subha and asubha. Subha means what is agreeable, virtuous, or good. Asubha means disagreeable, wicked, harmful, or bad. When the mind is under the sway of subha vasanas, it is said to be a good mind. When it is under the sway of asubha vasanas, a bad mind. However bad other people may appear to be, disliking them is not proper. Likes and dislikes are both fit to be disliked. <laughs> that is, the, the problem lies not in the other people we dislike. The problem lies in our likes and dislikes. So what we should dislike is not other people. We should dislike likes and dislikes. In other words, we should separate ourselves from these likes and dislikes by holding on to ourselves. That's the only way we can, we can, we can, the word he used for, the, um, for like, when he said likes and dislikes are both to be disliked, the, uh, the verb he uses is um, uh, uh, verakatakana. That means they are, they are fit to be disliked or spurned or renounced. So when he says we should dislike the likes and dislikes, he means we should, we should renounce them, give them up. And we can give up likes and dislikes. That is, likes and dislikes, it's the nature of ego to have likes and dislikes. So long as we rise as ego, we will inevitably have likes and dislikes. If we want to be free of likes and dislikes, we need to stop rising as ego. And to stop rising as ego, we need to hold on to ourselves. Very well put. So we uh, should always remember when we have problems with other people, those other people are as they are. The problem lies in us. Why should we have likes and dislikes? We, co we are caused trouble to ourselves by having likes and dislikes. If we could remain free of likes or dislikes, nobody could do anything to uh, disturb us. True equanimity. Ultimately, all problems come with, from likes and dislikes. Thank if you. we are suffering in any way, whether suffering because of um, because of uh, some physical illness, pain, or something, or suffering because of some or a difficult situation we're in life, in poverty, or in um, in relationship issues, or whatever type of difficulties we, we may face, they all those even if we may be starving, for example, if, we, if we're so poor we don't even have food, all these are problems because of our likes and dislikes. If we had no likes and dislikes, nothing would affect us. We could be in the midst of a war and remain unaffected by it. We could be dying of the most painful cancer and be unaffected by it. The trouble comes in, Michael, for me. I just found out that my son-in-law's father, the living epitome of good health at 71, vegan, runs miles every day, has four-stage cancer with nine parts of his brain isolated cancer all overnight. And the problem isn't my worrying about my pain. It's a, it's a, what, how to handle the pain in another, in the illusion of life. 
yeah, yeah. The dream seems awfully real to me when I know of a person that close to me who's suffering. That That is why so long as we rise as ego and see this world, we will inevitably have likes and dislikes. We we don't like to suffer ourselves. We don't like to see others suffering. So that is it's inevitable that we suffer so long as we we because so long as we rise as ego, we will have likes and dislikes. We can we can reduce the intensity of our likes and dislikes. We cannot be totally free of them, and particularly. Sometimes we can bear our own pain, but to see the pain of others is even more painful for us. Yeah, that's the point. So yeah, life is life is difficult. I mean, embodied existence is is misery if we are honest with ourselves. The only solution to all these things is to turn within and to subside back within. So long as we rise as ego. We, to a greater or lesser extent, we will inevitably have likes and dislikes. We will inevitably uh, enjoy the joys of life and suffer the, 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 the miseries of life. But they, these are all inevitable, so long as we rise as ego. By following this path, we can reduce the intensity of our likes and dislikes. We can become more detached, more equanimous more kind, caring, loving, all these things will happen to the extent that we follow this path. But the, the, the problems still remain to a greater or lesser extent. We can be free of all problems only by refraining from rising as ego. And we can refrain from rising as ego only by knowing and being what we actually are. That's why all questions finally must come back to the one fundamental question, who am I? Very good. Ult very ultimately, good. that is the only question worth considering. All the other questions are useful to the extent to which they point us back to this first question. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Michael. The, Thank the you. answer to this first question, who am I, can be found only by investigating ourselves, by seeing what we actually are.